this was a really hard presentation to put together because really the story isn't Docker. And I, I apologize, but we're going to start out with something else initially, early on in the talk, and then we'll get to Docker a little later. And so, um, so the presentation sort of coerced, I, I had to coerce it together. So I'm really excited. I think there's some really, really, really interesting stuff, but this is going to be a little different than what I usually do with all that shine and polish. This is going to be a little more haphazard. Um, and that's because what Docker really is, is it's kind of an emergent technology. The stage was set, and you couldn't help but have Docker occur as a result of the things that happened beforehand. It was, it was, it was an evolution, it wasn't a revolution. And that doesn't diminish what it does. It's a revolution in the impact it has on our community, but it isn't a revolution in technology. And so that made it a little difficult to explain because I really need to lay a lot of groundwork on what, where we came from. So this, this talk is going to be a little different, um, but I think, I think it's still a good talk. I think it's very interesting and you'll have some cool stuff to use. Um, so before I you know, dive into it, um, who am I? Um, I'm a Unix systems administrator. Um, uh, I generally work at a larger scale, so you know, tens, hundreds of servers, not one, two server. Um, so I think in that sort of way, um, I, I have a background in programming, though I, I do system administration, so usually I run other people's code. Though, um, as of late, I've actually been writing a lot of my own code, so who knows, in a couple of years, I may be a programmer uh, rather than a system. I doubt it. There's some real programmers in the room, and <laughs> I, I'm not as, uh, enough of a poser to claim I am one. But, um, so, uh, as in a lot of these presentations, um, I like to get into the history. So let's just get into the history of Docker itself, specifically the, the subject of this. So Docker, um, and the, the history starts on March 13th, uh, 2013, when Pope Francis was elected. And, um, and the reason why I bring that up is because that's when Docker was announced. And, well, one of these things did not make the front page in the New York Times. Um, and I, I'll let you guess which one of those it is. But just look at that date and think about how many times you've heard the word Docker and how much of a meme it's become. And for some of us, how much of a, this is changing things in ways I don't really understand yet. Um, this is less than two years old. This is really, really fast. Um, so this starts out at a company called Doc Cloud. And they were a platform, they are a platform as a service company, or were actually. Um, and they, as part of that offering, needed a way to run multiple customers' code on the same machine um, without the code being able to fuss with other people's code and things like that. So they developed this little Docker project and they released it out on the internet. And a few months later, they kind of said, oh, 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 um, yeah, let's, let's go with that. <laughs> And so they renamed themselves Docker. I mean, this is like, you know, months later, they, they saw the writing on the walls, um, and Docker was what it was. Um, you know, within that same year, they formed a collaboration with uh, Red Hat. Uh, Red Hat's a big supporter of Docker. Uh, so, you know, a little upstart, um, billion dollar Linux company. Um, that's not bad for a first year's effort. Oh, and uh, we're not done with the, the first year yet, but we've already got some venture funding coming in. And we're, uh, we're now you know, rolling in just past the first year mark, a uh, you know, year and a half, and we've got now another $40 million coming in. So, um, and then this last October, Microsoft actually started supporting Docker. So um, if you're a Azure user, and for people who don't know what Azure is, other than the color, um, it, is a, um, it is a cloud offering, the same way like Amazon Web Services or DigitalOcean, uh, these types of things. It, it's Microsoft's version of the same type of thing, or OpenStack, um, or, 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 or Rackspace's OpenStack, that is. Um, so they now support Docker containers within that. I'll define that word container later. And, um, and then, uh, you know, uh, they're doing something with Windows Server in the next few months. 
And I really couldn't suss out what it is. I don't know if anybody has been following this news. If, does anybody have any idea what this thing is? Okay, so there's a PR piece and it didn't really have details. So, um, so what Docker really is all about is isolating programs. And we've had a lot of different ways. We, we've, well, we've had a few different ways of isolating programs in the past. And so I'm just gonna go through just a few of them. Uh, not all of them, this is not an exhaustive list. But when you think about like, I have this program, I have my web server, and I absolutely want to be sure that the web server doesn't fuss with our HR server. So we've got we've got you know we've got our accounting and HR package with all the payroll records and things like that. We have a web server. We need to run both of them at the company. So what do you do? Well, you're like, okay, well I'll slap insert virtualization solution, VMware, um, KVM, um, whatever it may be. Um, you'll slap that on some hardware. You'll spin up a VM and put your accounting stuff in there, and then you'll spin up another VM and you'll put your web server in there. And that way, if something weird happens on the web server, you, you, you're not worrying so much about losing your, your payroll data because because it's coalesced, it's, it's on the same machine. So when you think about this, virtualization really is you have the same hardware, but you have two different kernels running on that hardware. And those kernels each have their own list of processes that they're running, they have their own file systems and their own networking, so they're completely isolated from each other. And they, they, they have this whole stack of infrastructure that supports each side of that. Um, so that's, that's kind of virtualization as I'm going to describe it for the purpose of this talk. Uh, we can talk more about it later. So what's a container? I said I was going to define that. So a container is very similar to virtualization, but rather than having different kernels, you have the same kernel. So you have one bit of hardware, you have one kernel, and you, you've configured and you've built the kernel and the software in such a way where the kernel hides the existence of other things on it. So that each container has a view, like I own the whole machine, and I have my own networking stack, and I can talk to the internet. But it has no idea that the accounting system is on the same machine. It can't see any evidence of that. And the accounting system's like, hey, I'm counting beans, and I don't know about any web server. So that's kind of the container. So you have the same kernel, but you have a whole different set of processes and file systems and networking in each of these sides in the two container environment, um, as I you know, mentioned in my example. So what's Docker? And how does it fit into this whole thing? It's a little, it's very similar to a container. In fact, they use the word container. But it's a little different because unlike the traditional container where you really have a rigid separate list of processes, separate file systems, separate networking, etc. In Docker, your file systems are sort of intermixed in a weird way, which I'll demonstrate and show you a little later. So you do have the same kernel, just like in a container, but you sort of have a mixture of isolated file systems, and then libraries, etc. And, and actually, you, you, you have fully isolated processes and networking. Um, so um, that's kind of what it is. So I, I, I call it container plus, because I think that's, it, it's not really like a dramatic different from, difference from previous container technology. This is just a container technology that's been implemented in a particularly good way. So what makes Docker tick? Um, so, actually let me just go back to that slide. Um, as I was saying, Docker is kind of emergent. It, it, it would happen. If it wasn't called Docker, it'd be called something else. It'd be called super, super container, whatever it may be. This is something that not only had to happen, but was going to happen whether or not anybody wanted it to. It's just a natural result of the technologies that have been built into the kernel up to this time. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna kind of leave the, leave the topic at hand a little bit, and we're gonna talk about those technologies. Uh, because once you understand those, you say, oh, of course I would have written Docker. Once you put them all in one room, you're like, that, 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 that's just what I would have done. So, 
Um, the first technology I'm going to talk about is an old one. It's called capabilities. And anybody here played around with, quote, capabilities? Yeah, yeah. It's kind of a weird system. So if you play with role-based access controls, capabilities are a little bit like that, too. Um, and what it was identified, over, I don't know, 10, 20 years ago, it's a positive standard, oh, a failed positive standard, um, was that when you wanted to do certain things on a computer, you needed to be root. And so root was able to do all of these special things that regular users couldn't do. But often we had a program like the web server Excuse me. Yeah, web server, which needed to be able to connect and listen to on a low number port, on port 80. Well, that's a special port. That's a privileged port. But you have to be running as root to connect to that port. So as a result, the web server has to run as root. Um, or if you had backup software and you wanted to be able to read every file on the system so you could back it up. Um, root can ignore file permissions, but everybody else must adhere by them. So, um, so uh, you know that that was another capability where now your backup software has to run as root in order to gain one of the sub components of what root can do. One of the sub capabilities. Root has many things it can do, but this software required just one of them. Um, so, what they came up with this was this concept of capabilities, where you could apply a capability to a various, various executables, to various programs on a computer. And what that would say is, is, this computer can do this one thing, it has this extra little privilege that is not normally allowed, but that's it. It can, you know, it can make arbitrary raw, uh, raw network connections. It can ignore file permissions. But that doesn't mean that it can do everything root can do. It can only do this one little thing. So you're breaking root up into a series of smaller subcomponents of, of the power of root and able to delegate those small components to processes on a need-by-need -need basis. So as a result of that process gets uh, broken into or there's a bug in it, maybe somebody can go ahead and cause havoc with your networking, but they can't delete all the files in the server. That's a much better outcome. So um, uh, there are lots of capabilities. I'll just give you kind of uh, three of them here that kind of stand out. So DAC override, um, capability DAC override means uh, DAC stands for discretionary access controls. This is why you might not be able to read a file as a regular user, but as root, you can read every file on the computer. You can write any file on the computer. Root has no restrictions, whereas everybody else does. Well, if you apply a cap in this capability, cap, DAC override to a program like, say, your backup software. Now it can read everything on the computer, but it doesn't have to run as root in order to do that. Um, CAP Net Admin allows you to uh, do configuration on network interfaces. So you know the little um, the little applets in the top, the widgets that you can you know switch on and off your wireless or flip the IP address in your interface. Well, CAP Net Admin would allow you to do that without having to be root. Um, so you can imagine, you know, you can have these configuration utilities that don't need to run as root, but can do these little changes. NetBinds, um, similar thing, it allows you to, say, run Apache as a non-root user. Um, and so uh, there are lots of these capabilities, and I think the best way to show it off is I'll just give a quick demonstration of what capabilities allows you to do. So I've got, um, I've got this little demo set up, and I'm just going to run you guys through um, the demo. So, oh, yeah. Go ahead and complain. And I need to put this near the top of the screen. Um, no. Let's try. That doesn't make it any better, but. Yeah, I just want the text to be at the top of the screen.
put it near the top of the screen so you can see it. Um, so here I'm looking at the ping, ping program. Um, and ping is kind of special. Uh, you can run it as any user, as we've probably all done, but ping needs a special capability. It needs to be able to access raw network sockets because it's not doing standard TCP IP type packets, so it needs a little more network granularity when it, when it talks to the wire. So as a result, it needs to run as root because root has that capability of making raw network socket connections. So if we look at the permissions on ping, you'll notice that it's, it's got this S right here. This is the, the user owner permissions. Uh, it's read, write, and then S. It's not X. Usually we see you know, executable, executables have an X there. When you have an X there, what that means is when you run this program, it will run as you. So if you, if you have execute permission on a program, then you are running that program. And it has all the same privileges you have. With S, that's called set UID or set UID. And almost everybody here is probably familiar with the set UID program. And when you execute those, those run as the user who owns the file, not as the person who's running the program. So in this case, because this file is owned by root, it means whenever I run ping, it runs as root. And that doesn't give me root privileges, it just means that when I, when I spawn that program in its own little execution environment, it's root. And so we can see ping doing its thing. Um, and this is a live test, so this is real live data. So I pinged myself, I pinged localhost, and I got a packet back. So it works, does what I expected. So now I'm going to do something weird, which is I am going to remove the set UID tag. So that's what this command does. And then if we look at ping here, you can see it's just conventional executable. So now let's try to run it. And you'll see that we get an error message. And it says, we can't do this. You don't have permission. And now, it's not giving the full details, but the full details is you don't have permission to open a raw socket. Um, so it's broken. It doesn't work. So uh, just to, to you know, show, unless you're root, so root has permissions to do that. So when root runs ping, ping can do its thing because it inherits root's permissions. And so here it works as root, but it doesn't work as conventional user. So what I'm going to do here, and this is a dense set of commands, is I'm going to first check ping. So that's this command here. And, and it has no output. That's why you don't see anything underneath it. So ping doesn't have any special capabilities applied to it. And then over here, I'm going to apply a capability, uh, cap net raw. So give it the capability to open a raw network socket, plus P, which I believe stands for permitted, which means you have this capability, rather than you could give it like a plus I, which you and all of your sub-processes have this capability. So you have some granularity there. Uh, so we're adding that capability to ping, and then when we run git cap again, we see that Ping is listed as having this capability to make raw network connections. So let's try it again. And you can see Ping's working now. So what I've done is I've taken a little piece of root and I said, okay, Ping, you can have this little piece of root. Um, and I think that's pretty neat. Um, that's, it's not super useful because the catch is, is you can only pass out capabilities based on kind of these major categories. So it doesn't have a lot of granularity, but we're starting to get towards the concept of, well, programs that are running on the same machine can have special abilities, but abilities that won't quite, you know, that, that don't allow them to fully take over the computer. So uh, I think that's cool. And that's one little piece of what is making Docker. This is a very early piece of what's making Docker possible. Oh, sorry. Um, let me jump back to my slide. So capabilities. So the next thing is something called control groups or C groups. And what C groups are associated with or what they're built to deal with is that you have a limited amount of resources on your computer. You have a limited amount of processor power, memory, CPU, networking capacity, things that dis disk bandwidth. And control groups allow you to control and manage how much various things are doing. Uh, anybody use NICE uh, in here? 
Yeah, read nice. Okay, so that's that's very similar. You're saying in nice when you're re-nicing something, make this guy less or more important. If you're if you're trying to figure out which process to run next, here's a little hint: this guy is more or less important. But with control groups, you can do a lot more. You can say this can't use more than this amount of memory. This is not permitted to use to saturate the network uh, the network bandwidth. Or maybe it's this can use as much network bandwidth as it wants, but if somebody who's more important comes by, it gets shoved, it gets descheduled out of the way. Um, and also allows you to do some auditing to say, how much is this process using? How, how much processor time? How much, uh, how much memory? Things like that. Uh, some of the things that you just mentioned, uh, you can do with what is control? So mm -hmm. the C control, um, Encompasses all of the features of Sys control and um, extends them, or mm -hmm. is it more something that you use in parallel? Yeah, yeah, no, and, and, and the C groups is more of a it's a framework, whereas it was a little catchy before on how how all of these things were kind of being put together. There was kind of a patchwork of technologies that provided some bits of these capabilities, some bits of management, but not other bits, and so. Yeah, a lot of this stuff isn't brand new, absolutely, and it's certainly not new to the, the computer world. Um, you know, I, I mean, systems have been doing a lot of these things, other operating systems, other Unixes have been doing a lot of these things for a long time. But this is this is a framework where you have pretty much, you have a very stable, good interface that allows you a lot of flexibility and allows you, um, allows you a fairly complete Ability to manage things that you tend to care about, that people tend to care about. It's not complete by all means, but it's got a lot of this functionality. Um, so yeah, um, you know, you're right to say that, that a lot of this functionality has existed in, in other things as well before. So with nice you can uh, limit the CPU usage, right? With yeah, nice, yeah, and actually I'll give a demonstration of that. So with this one, you can uh, limit the memory as well, like you can... Oh yeah, yeah, I'll give a demonstration of that too. So, how about, I'm not going to answer your question, I'll just show you how I do it. Um, and wait, the memory one's towards the end, so just wait with me. Um, so let's just give a quick demo of control groups. So, um, I'm going to go out of here and go to C groups, and I have a demo here, right? So what I'm going to do... And this may seem a little weird, but there's a file system, and it's one of these special file systems where it actually you may be reading or writing a file, but it's actually a it's controlling variables inside the kernel. Um, so there's this file system, the Cgroup file system, sysfs Cgroup, and in that file system, there's a series of files. So if we go sysfs C group, so this is the C group file system. See all of these things, and these are all things that you can control. And I won't get into all of these in part because I actually don't know what all of these do. But there's a few, like CPU, this is how you control how much CPU time something was allocated. Uh, CPU set, you could say this thing is allowed to be on this processor or that processor, so you control what chip, what actual chunk of silicon processes can run on. So you might say, I have these two busy things and I don't want a lot of context switching, so I'm going to give each one their own CPU, and that's going to reserve the capacity for those two things, and then I'll, you know, I'll tell other things not to run in their place. Um, there's, there's, I can, you, afterwards you can come to me on why you want to pin something to a CPU. Uh, memory, you can control how much something is able to allocate. So you may have, like in my case, 16 gigs of RAM, but you can only use 100. Um, that you're limiting that process. Um, so um, these are all pretty neat things. So, um, so let's look in that demo. So what I'm doing is I'm making this subdirectory called limit CPU. And so I'm, I'm making it a CPU controlling um, a C group. So that means that this group will be concerned with controlling how much CPU time the process gets. And I, I'm making this directory called limit CPU. Let's see if that directory exists, actually. Um, let's see, CPU. I, I, I ran this demo, I tested this demo out. Okay, so that directory doesn't exist here. Okay, cool. 
So let's just go ahead and make that directory. Uh, oh, I need to be root. Okay, so now when we look in there, uh, CPU, and so I created this directory, limit CPU, and you see, I didn't make any of these files. They just sort of, poof, appeared. The kernel said, oh, you want to create a C group called limit CPU, and here are the variables you can manage in that, in that control group. So there's a bunch of these variables, and the two I'm going to play with is this CFS period and quota US. So this, this controls how much process time, real time, a process gets. So you can go ahead and control things like, well, this program is permitted, if this program is higher priority than that program, and there's there's things, um, there's, um, what is it, I think it's uh, CPU shares allows you to do that, so you can adjust the scheduling priority of a process. But what this says is, is that in this period of time, you are allowed this many process, this much processing. So this is, these are in periods of milliseconds. So for every period milliseconds, you get quota milliseconds of time. And then after that, you're cut off. You stop. You will not run any longer than that. So you can set up a, an upper limit. I think this also sets the lower limit. You get this much time if you ask for it. Um, I'm not positive, though. Don't quote me on that. Don't base your business off of what I say test it. Um, so, um, I'm just going to go ahead and run this, uh, the, the demo script, um, and it's going to complain about something. So what I did was I said, for every 100,000 milliseconds in this group, any processes that are in, in this C group, give them 5,000 milliseconds of runtime, and then that's it. They can't run any, far, any longer than that. So let's try a little demo of this. So stress C1. So what stress is, it's a program to stress your computer. It does a lot of nothing very hard. Um, and in this case, I'm saying, go ahead and saturate a single CPU on this computer. So it's going to fire up, and it's just going to hammer a single CPU on this computer. Um, and if you're near enough to me, you might actually hear the fan kick in. But if we look, we can see there's stress, and you can see there's a little overhead, but it's using 99% of, I have one core, or I have uh, four cores in this computer, so if I have one, you can see, you know, I'm using, um, I'm using one of them up, essentially, uh, one's worth of capacity. So that's what stress is doing. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this process ID and I am going to add it to the processes that are part of this C group. So I'm going to echo um, that process ID. And I swear there's a reason for this torturous command. Um, SysFS um, C group CPU. Limit CPU C group prox. So what this file is is this file contains a list of all of the processes that are in this C group. Right now the file's empty because I haven't added any processes to that C group. But I'm going to go ahead and say, hey, add this process to your C group. So I'm going to do that. It's going to ask me for my password, and now it's added to the C group. And let's look at the process now. And you'll see that that C group. Remember I said 5,000 uh, milliseconds out of every 100,000, so that's 5% of, uh, of, you know, of the time on a CPU. And you can see, there I am, I'm pegged right at 5%. Stress is running as hard as it can, and the kernel's saying, ah, why don't you take a, why don't you take a 95,000 millisecond break before I let you come back in here. So I think that's pretty neat. Um, and that's, I mean, imagine this. Um, you, we, we do this with networking all the time. It's like, oh, um, pause BitTorrent. I want to watch something on Netflix. Or, um, oh, my computer is really, really churning and my flash is skipping a lot. Um, I'll go ahead and shut down something that's consuming a lot of CPU. What if you could just throw it into another group and you could say, hey, you, you're really low priority. If my web browser wants some processor time, take a break. 
And now you don't have the, the, the kernel is managing that stuff. You don't have to quit your processes. If you have a big compile, things like that, you can you have fairly granular control. And you can do this with all sorts of resources, with memory, with disk bandwidth. So, um, so this can be quite powerful. So that's just a little demonstration of what secrets can do for you. Um, so back to the slides. Oh, I did that again. Pardon me. I'm going to give a lot of these presentations. Um, so the next thing is something called namespaces. So I think capabilities was kind of neat, but a little, a little limited, kind of annoying to use. C groups is starting to get interesting. Like that's useful. I don't know about you, but uh, when you when you boot up your computer, you will find that uh, that some uh, some OSs, some Linuxes, will actually use C groups right out of the box. They'll say, "Hey, you're using a GUI application. We're going to give that." preference over other stuff running on your machine because you notice those 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 lags, you notice a quarter second tick. Whereas like, you know, your your underlying services, yeah, that can, hey, I, they have to wait around, they don't care. They don't notice. It doesn't seem slow. Um, so namespaces is where we start to get a little sci-fi. So remember I said containers are where you can have multiple processes that are running on a computer and they they aren't even aware of each other. They can't see each other. They're on the same kernel, but they have no visibility to each other. So this is what namespaces allows us to do. It provides isolation for a set of processes. Um, so you can take a bunch of processes and you can say, hey, you, you're in a namespace together. And then you say another set of processes. And you say, hey, you, you're in another namespace. And if you go and you do PS in each of those namespaces, you won't see the stuff in the other namespace. Those processes won't exist. Um, so the principle in namespaces is that they're they're kind of hierarchical. So you know, in your base OS, when you boot up a computer, you're in this namespace, the kind of generic global namespace, and you can create other namespaces where you isolate programs into their own namespace. What you can do is you can see the things that are running in those namespaces, but they can't see back out. They have their perception of the universe, which your perception includes theirs, but theirs does not include you. So you can see the children, but the children can't see the parents. So there's lots of different types of namespaces. You can use one or many of these in any particular application. So if you have a program, if you, you create an execution environment for a program, you can use the hid namespace, which limits what processes things can see. So literally, if you do a PS, you just won't see things that aren't in your namespace. Um, there's a net namespace. You get like, this is, I think, really cool. You like get your own network card, a, a virtual network card, mind you, but it looks like you have an ethernet interface, an ETH0, that is not shared by anybody else on the system. You have your own routing table, you have your own firewall in this namespace. So you like you're really quite isolated in these. You can you can do some kind of neat stuff in these. Um, there's an IP an IPC namespace. I won't get into this, but for people who know what IPC is, it's kind of like a bit namespace. You have different IPC IDs in there, and you can't see each other's. You have a mount namespace. So if you say who's on root in your root namespace, you know you'll say dev sdb one, and if you go to one of your child namespaces. It does not need to be the same thing. It can be whatever you want it to be. So this is a lot like Chirrut, except that this is a little more fundamental. This is IO system level rather than just even the directory level. Um, so it, the, 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 in that namespace, your concept of the file system does not include um, things that are outside of your namespace. Um, there's a UTS namespace. You can have a different host name in each of these namespaces, which is, I think, kind of neat. Um, that I don't know what UTS stands for, no, I don't need to, but it just means you can set a different host name in each of these namespaces. And then you have a, a user namespace, and this is a little weird. Essentially, it provides a mapping back and forth, so you can run as, quote, root in a namespace, but outside of the namespace, when you look at the processes, they're actually running as salad. Um, so it, it, it may think it's root, but it actually isn't. Um, so, when you look at this, this is not a complete picture. There are some things that aren't in the list, but essentially you're, you're, you're creating a pretty impressive illusion to a program. 
Hey, you, you have a whole computer all to yourself, we promise. No, no, not actually. Um, so let's just kind of, I, I got a really quick and dirty demo of what mean spaces look like. So, um, mean spaces, okay. So, yep, that's all I got, okay. So if we look at PS on my computer, I've got some things running, right? Bunch of stuff. I mean, pretty much everybody in here, if you're running Linux, you got, you know, well, let's see, how many processes do I have? I have, I have 266 process threads running on my computer. Yeah, it's respectable. It's kind of what happens. I, I just make me feel secure at night, but it is what happens nowadays. So now I'm going to run this little program called NewPid. Oh, I have to be rude. So now I'm in a, a, a new process namespace. I'm in a new PID namespace. I don't, I don't have all the namespaces, I just have the PID namespace. So I'm sharing the same networking and things like that. But, but my view of processes is markedly different. So if I do PSEF, I have three processes. Here, let me just do top. That's what's running. That's it. In this namespace, that's all I see. There's no other processes on this machine. It's a pretty quiet server. And oh yeah, what's this weird? Isn't that supposed to be in it? I thought I didn't always got one. So I think this is kind of cool. Like this is weird. I, I, and then this is this is where we start using the word container. The processes that are existing in these namespaces don't see each other. So they're contained. They have their own view of reality, and they don't, they don't share anything with the other views of reality. Um, or at least nothing that would be disruptive. So you'll notice that in this namespace, it still shows I have 16 gigs of RAM and things like that. It just doesn't have any concept of what other processes are running. It even can see that you know I'm using some memory, but it doesn't know what it's being used for. It, you know, it'll do a count and say, huh, you seem really short out of memory given how much I'm using. Um, so namespaces are, now we're starting to see Docker. We're starting to see that containment, that isolation I was talking about before. So the last thing I'll talk about, and then maybe we'll break for five minutes, uh, is um, UnionFS, uh, or actually AUFS, or another union file system. Um, you, you've seen these, yeah, yet another pilot compiler, you'll notice these names all over. Um, so there was a union at best, and it was not good. Not bad, but just not good. And people said, hey, we can make that better, and they did. And there are other people working in this space. There's several union file systems. But what the concept of a union file system is, is one that demands higher wages. I'm sorry, confused. Uh, is something that combines multiple file systems together um, to present a unified view. When I say a unified view, it's not like, here I have this tree and all the file systems are leaves on the node. It's, when I look at this directory, I'm seeing files from several directories in an amalgamated combined view. So it layers them on top of each other. The best way I've got to describe this is, I, um, I had some relatives who went to Europe uh, last year traveling, and they went to, uh, they went to Italy and they saw all of these ruins in Italy, you know, the, the, the toppled-down temples and so forth. And they bought a book that was really kind of neat. It was a picture of these ruins, but it had a clear plastic acetate sheet that was, that was you know, bound in between the pages so that when you flip the sheet up, you could see those ruins. When you flip the sheet down, they had drawn on that sheet the, the original structure, so they'd shown the, you know, what the original towers looked like, and maybe they planted some gardens and things like that, so you could see the splendor of what was there, and then flip it open and say, oh, oh, that doesn't look so good. Oh, hey, that would have been nice. Oh, oh, that doesn't look so good. So this is what Union FS allows us to do. It allows us to look through these layers to get a unified view, but meanwhile, what we've actually got is, um, is, is isolation, you have separations of these layers. So you have a base layer, like that, that picture of the ruins, 
And then you have a layer, like a clear acetate, that says, okay, let's start with this picture of the ruins and make all of these changes to it. Add this and add that, change this and change that. And this is what Union file systems allow us to do. Um, so when you do stuff in a Union file system, for example, you, you have these files layered up. If you make a change, say you want to edit the information that's in the bottom layer of file system, um, and you try to change that, what it'll actually do is copy it into the top layer of the file system and write your changes up there. So you never affect that bottom layer. You're not actually changing the bottom layer. All you're doing is putting a copy of something on top of it so you can't see that bottom layer anymore. So when you look at it, it's like, hey, I changed that file. But the reality is the original was never touched. And there's also something called whiteout, uh, which is not only great for correcting mistakes, but when you use it in Union File System context, um, whiteout means that if you hit delete on a file, it just paints over that spot as empty. So the file has never been touched in the original file system. There's just a little indicator on that top file system that says, hey, if you're looking, this file isn't here anymore. I swear, I swear it's gone. Um, so these are Union file systems. So let me just give a quick demonstration of that. I, I think that's kind of cool. So I'm going to get rid of that, get out of this, um, out of that main space. And I'm going to go over to the AUFS stuff. And let's look at my demo over here. So uh, I'll speak it and then I'll do it. So I'm making three file systems here. I'm making, in the temp directory, I'm going to make a dir1, a dir2, and a mount. Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to combine these. So these are the two things I'm making stuff in. And this is the mount point where I'll put the union file system. And I'm going to put a file called file1 one in dir1 one with the contents of dir1. So that's the text in that file. Um, dir1, I'm also putting that in the file called 12. And then in the directory 2, I'm doing similar things. I'm creating a file 2, and I'm adding dir2, and I'm creating a, um, a file 12. So you'll notice, each of these directories has a file that the other one doesn't have, and they also share one file. So this is going to give us a sense for what these things look like. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this command, mount at dash uh, T A U F S. So I'm saying I'm mounting a union file system, and one and the option is what file systems, what directories rather, and file systems am I drawing them on to make this unified? And I'm saying. Um, and, and, and in AUFS, they have this concept of branches. So what branches do I have that I'm going to lay on top of each other in order to make that unified file system view? And so in this case, I'm going to do dir1. So that's going to be on the top, I believe. Yeah, on the top. And then dir2, and that's going to be on the bottom. I might have this reverse. I think it's, yeah, I have it right. And I'm going to mount that on temp mount. So what I should see at this point is the contents of both of these of, of both of these directories here. So let's go ahead and just fire that demo up. Okay. So now I'm in demo mode. So let's go over to temp and let's just do. Um, uh, yeah. Thank you. So. Can everybody see, by the way, do I need to raise this up a little higher? No, you, you come closer. You wait, come closer, seriously. Come on, I'll wait. I don't want you to miss anything. Sure. <laughs> is this a kernel uh, file system or a user space file system? Um, it is a kernel file system. I had to be rude to do the mounting. Though there are capabilities I can add to. Yeah, OK. I won't get into my capability thing. Um, so what I've done is I did an ls on the dir directory. So you can see dir1, I have those two files that I created. That's not a surprise. And in dir2, I have those two files that I created. But remember, I'm unionizing these. I'm combining them and creating a view. So let's look at mount. And you can see all three. Well, hold on. I have four files. Why don't I only see three? And that's because two files are lying on top of each other. So you can only see the top one. You can't see the bottom one. And so I've got the file 1, I've got the file 2, and then I've got one of those two file 12s. So let's look at what's in there. So let's go to mount. 
and we can see all this stuff. So okay, file one, and what's going to be in file one? What will it say? Dir one. Hey, what a surprise. And file two? Dir two. And file 12. Dir one. Because dir one is on the top. So now I'm going to do something funny. I'm going to add a new file to one of the underlying file systems. So I'm going to go to dir two, and I'm going to call it file uh, 2.2. And then if I do an ls, you can see, though I added it to that directory, it got pumped up through the layers, and this is what I see. So if I do a cat on file 2.2, you can see that there's nothing in it. That's kind of boring. So let me edit it. I'm going to add some stuff to it. Neat stuff. And I'll write my changes and cat. File 2.2. There's some neat stuff in 2.2. But now let's go back and let's look at what's in the file in that uh, dir2 directory. You can see it's still empty. So my changes didn't get written to the bottom layer, they got, ri uh, got written to the top layer. I can speak English, I swear. Um, and so if I go look in dir1, you'll see this file 2.2. And there's the neat stuff. So the changes were written to the top layer. So you're layering these things up, and you've got you've got one read-write layer at the very top where all of your changes, all that stuff's happening. And you have all these layers, and you can have many of them. I, I forget how many you can have, but it's a large number. If you want this many, then you're probably uh, you're probably doing it wrong, actually. Um, but uh, but you can have a number of layers la laid up and you're combining and creating that unified view. So now you're getting into really what makes Docker possible. This is the final linchpin of, oh, oh, that's what makes it all, and now, oh, 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 hey, ah. Um, and so now that we know about all of this stuff, we can go ahead and, uh, let's see, where's the namespaces? Yep, we can start talking about Docker um, oh yeah, this is just a this is a graphic I stole from Docker's site. Uh, I, uh, just a um, attribution. Oh, go ahead. Uh, I'm in the presentation. So you can see you have this the, this root file system. And you have the base image, and you have the images layered on, and then you have this quote writable container at the top. And that's their word container. The container contains the stuff that's being written on top of all the stuff below it. So that's, that's the part uh, about the backing and what makes Docker possible. I have not shown you any of Docker yet, but does anybody feel the need to go to the bathroom or do anything like that? Five minutes?